The Salgado family believes someone close to her killed her. Her body was found in a canyon just outside of Springville. May have tried fighting for her life. It's approaching seven years that the family last heard from Salgado. They only hope justice will soon come their way. Why is it taking too long, you know, for them to actually solve this uh, murder? Elizabeth Elena Laguna Salgado was born on November 6th, 1988, growing up in Chiapas, Mexico. She was one of seven siblings, with her mother later saying, as the oldest girl, she was the one to set the example for the other children and was a loving daughter. Elizabeth and her family would become members of the LDS Church in 2004, where she would later on volunteer teaching at a local Sunday school. After graduating high school, she would attend college, eventually graduating with a degree in industrial engineering. It was at this point in her life that she wanted to step away from education and focus on her faith, deciding it was time to serve on a mission for the LDS Church. She would leave home in May of 2013, serving a mission in southern Mexico, returning home a year and a half later in November of 2014. After returning home from her mission, Elizabeth's next goal was to spend some time in the United States, wanting to attend a language school to brush up on her English skills before ultimately settling down in Mexico City and starting a career in industrial engineering. She would eventually choose Provo, Utah, partly because of the area's affiliation with the LDS Church, and also she felt it would be a very safe place for her to live. Elizabeth would receive a scholarship from the Norman Global American English School and soon begin an eight-month American English class. Elizabeth would make the move to Provo, Utah on March 23, 2015. She struggled to get along with her original roommate, who she claimed were loud, messy, and always having people over. They also didn't speak any Spanish and didn't put any effort into attempting to communicate with Elizabeth and this would add more tension to an already strained household. Just 10 days after moving to Provo, Elizabeth would once again move to another apartment complex and move in with a new set of roommates. Her new roommates were both from Korea and they didn't speak much English either. But despite this language barrier, she got along with them much better than her first set of roommates as they were clean, quiet, and spent most of their time by themselves. Elizabeth would also get a job waiting tables at a nearby Mexican restaurant. She really enjoyed this job as it gave her a chance to practice her English skills while speaking with the patrons at the restaurant. At this point in her life, pretty much all of Elizabeth's family still lived back in Mexico, but she did have two uncles that lived nearby in the United States. Her uncle Rosenberger lived in California in a town just a few hours away from Provo. And her uncle Rudy lived in Orem, Utah, which is the town right next to Provo. So he was just right across town from Elizabeth. Her uncle Rudy would stop by and spend time with his niece. And he would give her rides across town whenever she needed it because Elizabeth did not have a vehicle of her own at this time. Elizabeth also called her mom on the phone pretty much every day and kept in constant contact with her mother and siblings via a messaging app. After moving to Provo, Elizabeth started attending church at the Provo YSA 140th Ward. She met a lot of new friends through the church, and a lot of them also spoke Spanish, so she had people she could talk to and also practice her new English skills with, which she very much appreciated. Elizabeth was often described as a beautiful young woman and usually had at least a few gentlemen interested in trying to date her. But according to her mother, Elizabeth had no interest in dating at all, as she was up in Utah to focus on English skills to further advance her career. So dating was just out of the picture at this time. Elizabeth would quickly settle into a routine of attending school, working at her job at the restaurant, and attending church events. And she started to enjoy her time up in Provo, although she was super homesick and missed spending time with her family back down in Mexico. She would live in this area for about four weeks before her disappearance, where she was last seen by her classmates early in the afternoon of April 16th, 2015. At around 1.30 p.m. that day, 
Elizabeth would text her uncle Rudy, asking if he could stop by her apartment later and pick her up and if they could just go to Walmart together. And her uncle Rudy accepted and said that he would be by at around 5 p.m. to bring her to Walmart. About an hour after that conversation, Elizabeth's sister, Sarah, texted her saying, Hey, I love you. What are you doing? as a way just to check up on Elizabeth. Elizabeth would reply pretty quickly saying that she was just leaving school and heading home. About 30 minutes later, her sister Sarah would text Elizabeth again, asking Elizabeth if she had made it home from school. And Elizabeth would never respond to this text message. Two and a half hours later, after this conversation, her uncle Rudy would arrive at Elizabeth's apartment, which he would knock and knock, but nobody answered the door. After about five minutes of this, he pulled out his cell phone to give Elizabeth a call just to see what was going on, but the call would go straight to voicemail. Worried about his niece, he decided his next step would he was going to go to Walmart himself and just take a look around, hoping that maybe Elizabeth had gotten a ride from someone else or had walked there and just had forgotten to let her uncle know that he she didn't need a ride from him anymore. But when he got to Walmart and took a quick walk around the store looking for her, he never never saw her and there was no sign Elizabeth had been there. After this, he decided his next step was to swing by her workplace, thinking that maybe Elizabeth had taken an extra shift that afternoon and just forgot to check in and let him know. But when he got to her work, he discovered that none of her coworkers had seen her that day. In fact, Elizabeth had the day off, so they weren't expecting to see her at all anyways. So despite all these red flags and kind of the weird circumstances around his niece disappearing, her uncle Rudy thought to himself that Elizabeth had often mentioned going to church events and little social gatherings and whatnot, and he told himself at the time she probably got a last minute invite to hang out with people from church or was doing some sort of church related activity. So he put his worry aside and just thought everything was okay. He would probably hear back from Elizabeth later that night or the next day. And her uncle Rudy just went about the rest of his evening. But the following day brought a worrying silence as nobody had heard or seen from Elizabeth. Now her mother being extremely concerned at this point, she reached out to her brother Rudy, asking him if he could stop by the language school and see if she just happened to be in class that morning. And this is when they discovered that they, the language school didn't have class on Friday, so nobody was there. At this point, Rudy went back to Elizabeth's apartment and knocked on the door. And this time, her roommates answered. And this is when, talking to her roommates, he discovered that they too hadn't seen Elizabeth since she went to school the day before. So yesterday morning, she went to school and the roommates hadn't seen her since. At this point, her uncle Rudy and the two roommates decided to check up on her room and see if she was in there. And this is when they discovered that all of Elizabeth's personal belongings were still in her room. There was nothing missing. Even her passport was still in the room. And this, this started to worry Rudy and the rest of the family. As they began to investigate further, this is when they discovered that Elizabeth had not shown up for work that day at the Mexican restaurant. And she didn't call in sick or check in with anyone at the restaurant either. With mounting concerns and an increasing sense of urgency, it was at this point where Elizabeth's family decided it was a time to report Elizabeth missing and get the authorities involved. The police dove into this case right away, looking for any signs of Elizabeth and attempting to build a timeline and interview potential witnesses. But after weeks of doing this, they failed to build any kind of potential leads. They discovered that on the afternoon of Elizabeth's disappearance when she was walking home from school, those text messages between her and her uncle Rudy and her and her sister were the last bits of um, 
phone activity on Elizabeth's phone. She was pinged on a tower nearby the school, confirming she was at that location when she left. But after that, her phone had either been off or broken and had not pinged any cell phone tower since then. And it was also at this point they dug into her banking and figured out that since the afternoon of her disappearance, there was no banking transaction. So she was not spending her money at this point which really grew um, worry in the family. Despite all the evidence and strangeness about her disappearance, the police chief of Provo emphasized that there was no concrete evidence of a kidnapping. Although this disappearance was extremely suspicious, and really got their attention. Two years after her disappearance in April of 2017, Elizabeth's family, desperate for a lead, would put up an offering for a $50,000 reward to anyone who could provide information leading to um, Elizabeth's discovery. But the situation remained shrouded in uncertainty as the search for Elizabeth continued. Then on May 11th, 2018, so just over three years after her disappearance, an unnamed man was driving up Hobble Creek Canyon, which is located just outside of Provo a little ways, and he had plans to go camping up there for the weekend. But at some point on the drive up into the wilderness as he was looking for his campsite, he got the urge to relieve himself. So he pulled off the side of the road, got out of his vehicle, and he was just going to walk into the wood line a little bit, get in the shrubs where no one could see him and do his business. And as he walked a couple hundred feet into the woods, this is when he stumbled upon something. And right there in the middle of the forest, he discovered what appeared to be a scattered skeleton, a human skull, and just bits and tatters of clothing. And he left right away, got in contact with law enforcement, and reported this discovery. 12 days later, on May 23rd, 2018, the Provo Police Department would announce to Elizabeth Salgado's family and the media that they in fact discovered the remains of Elizabeth Salgado. And the next day, on May 24th, 2018, they would officially change her case from a missing persons case to an active homicide investigation. And one more thing to note that although the medical examiner wasn't able to confirm a cause of death due to the condition of the remains after being left out in the wilderness for three years, one thing they did discover is that on her skull, she had several of her front teeth missing, which kind of points to the idea that whatever happened to Elizabeth is that she put up a fight and she sustained that injury during the last moments of her life. Now moving forward in the investigation, there were several theories on what may have happened and several people who were looked into as people of interest. Now, one of the first persons of interest was a boy that Elizabeth went to school with. And her uncle Rosenberg told police that Elizabeth on the phone at some point before her disappearance had talked to him about this boy at school who had been asking her out and was interested. And she had told him no, she wasn't interested in dating him and he had gotten very upset about it. And her uncle Rosenberger only knew his first name, but that was enough for detectives to go off of. So detectives were able to take that information and line it up against school records and they tracked the boy down. Now the boy, he was very cooperative with police. They, he allowed them to look in his vehicle, search his home, look at his personal belongings. Talking to him, interviewing him and his friends, all their stories lined up and his alibi checked out. So he was quickly cleared off the list of um, potential suspects. The next suspect, who police looked into was a construction worker. So he worked at a construction site that just happened to be along the route that Elizabeth would take walking to and from school every day. And talking to the other construction workers, all of them kind of ratted this guy out saying, he's kind of weird, he had an interest in her and you should definitely look into him. This guy also knew where Elizabeth worked 
and he had been coming to her work and trying to flirt with her and whatnot, and it made Elizabeth super uncomfortable. She had talked to her Uncle Rudy about it, and this whole situation was to the point that her Uncle Rudy had been telling Elizabeth that she should just quit her job, just focus on school and her church thing, And her Uncle Rudy even told Elizabeth that he would, out of his own pocket, pay for everything she needed just so she could get away from this guy. And yet again, investigators were able to track him down. They were able to search his vehicle, his home. They were able to verify his alibi and his story. And although he had very strange behavior and was acting super creepy towards Elizabeth, he too was checked off the list of suspicious people. Now in 2021, the private detective, the same guy who had been working on the Gabby Petito case, he discovered something very interesting. And I find this one to have the most potential and that could possibly blow this case wide open. Just days before her disappearance in 2015, Elizabeth would attend an event here at Kelly's Grove Park. Now, what's notable about this location is this park is just a few miles away from where her body would eventually be discovered three years after her disappearance in 2018. This event was put on by the church, specifically the Young Singles Group, as a way for all the single churchgoers to intermingle and meet each other. So investigators believe at this point that someone who attended this event at Kelly's Grove Park would end up being her killer. Now just given the timeline of events that she was in this park just four days before she disappeared and her body would reappear just five miles east of here, three years later indicates that this location may have had something to do with her disappearance. Now, although this event took place eight years ago, investigators are still hoping that someone who may have been at the event would either have pictures or know who she was talking to. So if any of you were at this park in this pavilion in 2015 and may have seen who Elizabeth was talking to, may hold the key to solving this case once and for all. Now, this is where investigators currently are at this point, nine years later after her disappearance is they're looking for anybody who was at that park in 2015 who could possibly list off a name of people who are there or any potential suspects or anyone who's at the park with Elizabeth on that day. The police want to know. So if you know these things, if you were at that park in 2015 with Elizabeth Salgado and you have any information, I will provide contact information for you in the bottom in the bio. Now, this is the point in a case where it usually goes cold and my videos end. But this particular case takes one more extremely strange turn. In August of 2021, Elizabeth Salgado's aunt, Miriam Salgado, also goes off the radar. Her aunt had a history of some mental health issues, and it was, wasn't uncommon for her to kind of run off on her own and break contact with the family for days to even weeks at a time. This time, she had gone off the radar to the point it concerned the family enough that they wanted to get in contact with law enforcement. Now, law enforcement can confirm that they had stopped her at a location in Southern Utah on August 19th, 2021, where they had stopped her and talked to her when she was sleeping in her car in a remote area. Now, a few days after she was stopped by deputies in Southern Utah, her car was discovered abandoned on this lonely desert road in the middle of Southern Utah about halfway between St. George and Zion National Park. And just like Elizabeth Salgado, her aunt Miriam Salgado goes completely missing. And just like Elizabeth Salgado, two years later in 2021, a hiker discovered Miriam Salgado's body laid out in the middle of the desert about a mile from where her car was discovered. Now we're put in a situation where we have a case with the same family having two disappearances 
over the course of six or seven years where two female members of the family suddenly go missing. They go off the radar for several years and then their bodies are discovered miles into the wilderness, not buried or tampered with. And authorities have no leads on either case And both cases at this point are completely cold. Now we're approaching the nine year anniversary of Elizabeth Salgado's disappearance. And it has gone completely cold and is untalked about in the general public. And the family has no answers. And now we're faced with the question of, is there somebody out there slowly and meticulously killing off the female members of the Salgado family. And with that thought, when will they strike again? And who will their next victim be? If you made it to this point, thanks for watching the video. Please be sure to like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. It lets me know that you guys like this kind of content and gives me the impression that I should keep cranking these videos out as fast as I can. And thank you and hope you stick around for the next one.